morning. Good morning and welcome to all our regulars, a special welcome to any visitors, and also an extra welcome to anybody who might be watching us online. This is the first day of our live streaming, so there may be folk watching right now, or there may be folk watching later. I know that Anne-Marie and Bob, who are in New Zealand at the moment, promised that they were going to tune in, so they have signed up for the YouTube account, and it is probably about uh, 10 or 11 o'clock at night um, there, so, so well done to Anne-Marie and Bob for, for such loyalty that they are tuning in, uh, and I think my mum will be seeing it later. It's uh, 6 o'clock in the morning in Canada, so perhaps a little bit early. You won't notice much difference um, in terms of the way we do the service. Um, there may be the odd extra thing that gets added from time to time. We have, for example, an opportunity for folk who sign in if they want to make a comment. So when we're doing bits as we sometimes do in services where there's a bit of discussion, we might, if something is highlighted, one of the team at the back might let us know that so-and-so has, has, has said something. And we're looking forward to, to welcoming the folk from Benahee View. I don't know if any of them are watching today or not. If so, lovely to have them. Uh, we will be having some volunteers going in in future Sundays to, to keep them company. Uh, one more wee thing to highlight just is um, Elsie made me aware that there's been a change of bus timetables lately in the town on Sundays, which means that the, some of the bus, the bus arrives just at the centre, just about two to three minutes to the hour at the moment. So that might mean we experiment with starting just a few minutes later or having a slightly later relaxed start so that people don't feel too under pressure. And if you're running late, please, please don't worry about it. Just tuck yourself in. Nobody minds at all. So it's lovely to see you all here, early, late, here, present, or here online. We are here this morning to worship. We're going to be looking at two sets of conversations this morning, one between God, Samuel, and Eli, and the other between Philip, Nathaniel, and Jesus, and the, the two kinds of calling that they represent, summed up in the phrases, here I am, and come and see. So let us come and see the God who searches us and knows us. Let us come and seek the God who finds us and who guides us. Let us come and hear the God who calls us and who leads us. Let's begin with a song of commitment. Take my life, Lord, let it be.
Let us pray. Ever present Lord, what a gift it is to be here today, here in this place, here online, here in our own homes, here to stop for a while, to pause, to listen, to participate, to sing, to explore more about you, to find out more about how and where you are calling us to follow. You who know the words on our tongues before we speak them, who discern our thoughts from far away, help us to respond to your word with sensitivity and wisdom, to hear beneath the words shared today the invitation that you offer us, an invitation to be fully known, to be fully loved, to find purpose and peace in your presence. Hear us as we pray together. We have the words of the Lord's Prayer on the screen, or you can use the version you are more familiar with. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, may your holy name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today what we really need. Forgive us the wrong we do as we forgive those who wrong us. Lead us away from temptation. Keep us safe from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Someone who was leaving the service uh, the other week noticed our kind of collection, I think they're gone now, of, of dust bunnies that was sitting on the organ, and they were wondering what on earth all these bunnies were about. So I explained that, that last year during Lent, we had, oh, we've still got them, yep, there they are, that during Lent we had been searching for dust bunnies. And it made me think it was about time that we had another, another treasure hunt. So, so I've got something else for, for the kids to, to help find around the church today. And I thought, what are we going to look for? It's got to be something that's special and something that's exciting. So I thought about money, but you know, hey, money's not really all that exciting. So instead, I thought, I know, I know what would be really exciting. I decided on Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Now, some of you may be surprised to hear this because I have expressed my opinion on Brussels sprouts before. And it is true that exciting is not necessarily the first word that springs to most people's minds when they think about Brussels sprouts. But, I mean, look at them. They're, they're green. They're, they're green. <laughs> they're, they're like little cabbages. They're good for you, so, I mean, what's not to like? So, are you guys just as excited about Brussels sprouts as I am? No, I can see you shaking your head there, Beth. Yeah, absolutely. It isn't filling you with exactly great joy to go look for Brussels sprouts, but I would appreciate your help. So, if you start having a wee look around, see if you can find some Brussels sprouts lying about. There might be some underneath. There might be... Oh, what have you got there, Ella? Have you got... Oh goodness, now that Brussels sprout is a little bit smaller than my Brussels sprout. Oh, maybe we're looking for different kinds of Brussels sprouts. Mm, you might find some up near the front, if anybody wants a wee hint. There, oh, Ken's found one. Grown-ups can help as well. Oh, look, that's another strange, small Brussels sprout. Looks a little, a little more interesting. Are we getting a little more enthusiastic? Just, just wander about, girls. Just go find. See what else we can find? There's some tucked in. Oh, have you got one, Margaret? Absolutely. Isn't it strange? All these Brussels sprouts do not look quite like my Brussels sprout. Here we go. Have you got one, Kirsty? Or Emma? No? Have you got one, Kirsty? There we are. All hands on deck. You've got one there. Thank you. Thank you, Isla. Dick, you've got one as well. There we go. Oh, we got quite a little collection of Brussels for. Another one at the water cooler. There's a hint. Ella, do you want to run back and see if you can get one back there? Would you want to look up here? Yeah, absolutely. You're getting warm. Getting warm. You might find something tucked back here as well. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Brussels sprouts. Let's, let's pop them in the bag here. They're not Brussels sprouts. They're not Brussels sprouts. What are you saying, Beth? 
I mean, look at them. Don't they look like Brussels sprouts? They've got, well, they've got something. I, I, well, thank you very much, another Brussels sprout. So I'm, I'm experiencing some, some, some questions here. Some folk who don't think, thank you, thank you, that these really are Brussels sprouts. What do we think? Are they really, br oh, there's another one. We might be finding them for days, folks. Oh, thank you, thank you. And if we do find them for days, then that's something to look forward to. Okay, well, we'll maybe stop here. Now, Beth has said to me that they're not Brussels sprouts. Now, I don't know, that's a Brussels sprout and that's a Brussels sprout, right? Let's see what happens when we peel this Brussels sprout. We find more Brussels sprout. And more Brussels sprout, and underneath that, there's more Brussels sprout. I think we probably can't doubt that that's a Brussels sprout, indeed. Let's see what happens when we peel this Brussels sprout. Ooh, what do you know? <laughs> it doesn't exactly taste like a Brussels sprout. In fact, I would venture to say it tastes a little bit more like chocolate. So, who would prefer these Brussels sprouts? Yeah, fortunately, these are the ones that Junior Church got to take away with them in a minute. Although, they can also take these Brussels sprouts if they want. I had a, it would not be fair to say a revelation, but I had a moment yesterday when I was thinking about talking about this today. And I was thinking sometimes when we tell people about something, we want to get them enthusiastic about it. And because I shared my doubt about Brussels sprouts, several people have said to me, do you know what? They taste different than they used to. They're making different breeds these days. They're less bitter. I've had other people who said to me, you just have to cook them properly. And, that's, and that makes all the difference. So I was a skeptic, but I decided you don't know until you try. So last night, I ate a Brussels sprout. And you know what? I didn't hate it. I can't say I liked it, but it was okay. Sometimes when we talk to people about our faith or about church, I think we treat it as if it's just an okay Brussels sprout. We kind of get involved maybe because our families have told us to, or maybe because it's what we're used to, but we're not really that enthusiastic about it. So when somebody asks you about it, like some of the kids' faces when asked to look for Brussels sprouts, it was like, ugh, that's not very exciting. But when they saw these Brussels sprouts, sometimes it got a lot more exciting. And what Jesus says in one of the stories that we have, or what Philip, Jesus' friend, says to his friend Nathaniel, who isn't too sure, he thinks that this Jesus comes out of Nazareth and nothing good comes out of Nazareth and he's very skeptical. And Philip says, come and see, come and see. And that's something that we ought to be doing for other people. Lots of us have friends who don't know anything about church, they've never been before. They've maybe never been to junior church. And you might be going in and thinking, gosh, there's not many kids, not many young people there. But maybe that's because we haven't said to them, come and see. Come and see what it's like here. Come and see what we do at the Acorn Center. Come and see some of the groups we have. Come and see how I feel about these things. It's an invitation that God gives us and that we can give other people. And if you actually think Sunday worship or anything else we do is a bit like a blech, okay, Brussels sprout, come and talk to me. Come and talk to me about it. Give me your ideas, and maybe we can think of ways of making it even more interesting so that when you say to folk, come and see, they're going to come expecting Brussels sprouts and finding chocolate. And God offers us that invitation to any of us and to all of us at any time, not necessarily here at this church, but anywhere God's people are worshiping and meeting together, there is the chance to come and see what he's doing. We're going to sing now, and we're going to sing a song that invites the spirit and reminds us of that invitation. And after the song, the kids can go on to junior church and Biff or you can take leaders. I'm going to trust Biff with the chocolate. You girls can keep an eye on her. 
make sure that she's, uh, um, she's honest with it. Okay, let's sing together. Spirit of God, unseen as the wind. Dick's now going to read to us the first of our conversations, our passages about calling. The first reading is from 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 20, and you'll find that on page 267 on the Old Testament. In those days, when the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under the direction of Eli, there were very few messages from the Lord, and visions from him were quite rare. One night Eli, who was now almost blind, was sleeping in his own room. Samuel was sleeping in the sanctuary, where the sacred covenant box was. Before but dawn, while the lamp was still burning, the Lord said to Samuel, I beg your pardon, the Lord called Samuel, He answered, Yes, sir, and ran to Eli, and said, You called me, and here I am. But Eli answered, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord called Samuel again. The boy did not know it was the Lord, because the Lord had never spoken to him before. So he got up, went to Eli, and said, You called me, and here I am. But Eli answered, My son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. The Lord called Samuel a third time. He got up, went to Eli and said, You called me, and here I am. Then Eli realised it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to him, Go back to bed, and if he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord came and stood there, and called as he had before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, your servant is listening. The Lord said to him, Someday I am going to do something to the people of Israel that is so terrible that everyone who hears about it will be stunned. On that day I will carry out all the threats against Eli's family from beginning to end. 
I have already told him that I'm going to punish his family forever because his sons have spoken evil things against me. Eli knew that what they were doing, Eli knew they were doing this, but he did not stop them. So I solemnly declare to the family of Eli that no sacrifice or offering will ever be able to remove the consequences of his terrible sin. Samuel stayed in bed until morning. Then he got up and opened the doors to the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli about the vision. Eli called him, Samuel, my boy. Yes, sir, answered Samuel. What did the Lord tell you? Eli asked. Don't keep anything from me. God will punish you severely if you don't tell me everything he said. So Samuel told him everything. He did not keep anything back. Eli said, he is the Lord. He will do whatever seems best to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and made everything that Samuel said come true. So all the people of Israel, from one end of the country to the other, knew that Samuel was indeed a prophet of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your eyes. Amen. So, this is the first of our examples of what it could be like to be called by God. When you apply to be considered for training for the ministry, you're asked a lot about calling. You expect to answer questions about your sense of call, to discuss it, to analyze it, to write in your journal about it, to have it tested through experience and assessed by others. And yet it can still be something that's quite difficult to describe, a kind of a, a knowing without knowing how you know. Now in this picture in the Bible, it looks more straightforward than that, at least in the first place. We have Samuel lying sleeping in the sanctuary, probably sleeping lightly so that he could keep an eye on the fire that wasn't supposed to go out. Then he hears someone calling his name. He thinks it's his master Eli, the priest he works for. Three times he gets up, and three times he says the same thing to Eli. You called me, and here I am. Here I am. Wonderful, resonant, clear words that in themselves seem to capture a sense of calling even if Samuel wasn't aware at first of who was calling him. That's not surprising. The beginning of the passage makes it clear that a direct call or a vision from God is quite unusual in those days. Sometimes we think that in biblical times, God was, you know, on the phone or emailing people all the time and it was very direct. But it was unusual at that time, it says. Also, Samuel was a mere boy. If anyone was going to hear from God, it would be more likely to be Eli, the prophet and the priest. So far, so straightforward. God speaks in a nice, clear voice. We respond, and apart from the odd little case of mistaken identity, with the help of someone of experience, all is made plain. But I realized as I was reading this passage and thinking about holy endings and the new beginnings that they start, which is a sort of theme we have running through the next few services, that it isn't just about Samuel's call, it's also about Eli's call. God doesn't speak directly to Eli, but he does make sure that Eli gets the message. And the message is, Eli, your time is up. God doesn't deliver this message until Eli shows himself willing to hear it, which he does by first telling Samuel what to say and then insisting that Samuel repeat back to him what God has said. I get the idea that Eli knew what was coming. He'd been warned already about the consequences of his son's behavior and his own unwillingness to tackle it. So now in this moment, in the quiet morning light, from the voice of a child, he gets that judgment, that confirmation, judgment on his family and on Israel. And it's spoken by the boy who is going to take his place. Eli was no longer the mouthpiece of God, but he was still a man who had heard God. So he still has the courage to say, very painful words, he is the Lord, 
he will do whatever seems best to him. One of the things that I find the most heart-wrenching about these words is to compare them with the advice he gives to Samuel. So he says to Samuel, say to God, speak, Lord, I am listening. That's opening up a, a direct conversation with God, a, a you-me relationship, something personal and valuable. And once long ago, I imagine that Eli had the same experience, that he said, speak, Lord, I'm listening. And he heard the voice of God speaking to him. He was on this you and I basis with God. But now, due to his own failures, allowing his sons to corrupt the teachings of God, he now has to speak about God in the third person. He speaks of God as he, rather than speaking to God, you. But most of, many of us will find ourselves not in Eli's position. Very few of us will have the situation where we have a very specific calling that is very definitely taken away from us at a particular time. But most of us will have had a time when we've had to give something up. It might be giving up a role that we've always done. It might be giving up some activity that we have always enjoyed. It might be giving up a relationship or losing something of that nature, something that we have to leave behind in order to move on. Now, when you hear God telling you that clearly, it's easier to do. But more often, we hear God indirectly. We might hear it through the words of others, somebody's advice or affirmation. We might hear God through our experiences and the way we process our experiences. But God can't speak to us if we don't listen. There's no point in us saying, here I am, Lord, like Samuel does if we're not actually prepared to look around us and listen for what he's trying to say. A wise friend once said to me, if you want to know if God has a particular direction for your life, then look at what's been happening in your life in the last few years. Because if it is God's plan, then chances are he's already been preparing you for it. That was my experience when I finally did apply for ministry. The idea had been rolling around in my head for a number of years, but there was a number of internal and external factors that felt like they were stopping me from taking that move. It just seemed an impossible thing to consider. So when people asked me if I'd ever thought about going into the ministry, I'd glibly reply, oh no, God doesn't want me to be a minister. Very conveniently putting the blame on God for a decision I wasn't prepared to make or for the lack of a nice clear neon arrow to tell me where to go. Then there came a day when I was considering my future and making decisions, and I looked around and I realized that over the last few years, a number of financial and personal and work changes and other such circumstances had changed, and suddenly all the things that I thought were stopping me had actually melted away. And I realized that the only thing that was stopping me was me, my own doubts about whether I would do a decent job of it or whether I was fit for the role or what I might have to give up in order to be a minister. I decided those weren't good enough reasons and I gave it a go. Why I'm here today. I did my best to emulate Samuel's here I am Lord by filling in an application and sending it off five days before the closing deadline as I discovered once it was sent. God knows I think that I need a deadline to get anything done. What followed over the better part of a year was having to say it over and over again, here I am, here I am, here I am, as the call got tested again and again by my supervisor, by my placement congregation, by presbytery, and finally by national assessment. And all the while, I was trying to listen. Listen for God's response. Along the way, I had to deal with my own frailties and my own weaknesses and somehow come to accept that if God was calling me, he was calling me just as I am. Samuel must have had a difficult job imagining as a young boy, unfit for, for, for unready for adult life that God was calling him. Sometimes it's our own self-assessment that stops us moving forward. We decide what we can and we can't do, and we stop listening to God. Maybe Eli got paralyzed by his responsibility. Maybe 
God stopped talking to him, or maybe he stopped listening to God. When Eli stopped listening, God began to prepare a new set of ears, the boy Samuel, who was dedicated to him. And Samuel went and chose another boy, the boy David, who was to become king over Israel. A boy, a man with his flaws, and even sometimes active sins. But David never committed the sin of cutting himself off from God. He still kept coming back. He still kept responding to that call and saying, here I am, here I am in hope, here I am in joy, here I am in excitement, here I am in guilt, here I am in pain, here I am in desolation. To be called by God is to let go of what we expect and open ourselves up to what God offers. It's not always easy. We may not like what we're called to do. Samuel's first message was to tell his, his master of this terrible sentence that God had pronounced. And Eli helps him to do that. He allows those difficult words to be spoken. In a way, Eli allows his role as a prophet to have a holy ending. Not long after this news, Eli's sons were killed. And when he hears it, he falls off his seat and breaks his neck. But before that happened, he was allowed to pass his role on to someone else. Each of us has some kind of calling from God. Sometimes we're called to take something up like Samuel. Sometimes we're called to let something go like Eli, although hopefully not so drastically. Fortunately, not many of us are called to the tough job of prophecy. But we're all called to something. And we all have certain resistances that we need to work through in order to answer that calling. In a few minutes, we're going to look at the call of Christ. We're going to look at that general call, which is to all of us, rather than that sense of specific call. But first, let's echo that commitment of Samuel, here I am, by singing together, I the Lord of sea and sky.
may be that some of us know what it is to wrestle with a difficult sense of call or a direct sense of call. But all of us can know what it is to be called by Christ. Dick's going to read for us again. This reading is John 1, verses 43 to 51, and it's on page 118 on the New Testament. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come with me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the town where Andrew and Peter lived. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one who means we have found the one who Moses wrote about in the book of the law and whom the prophets also wrote about. He is Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathanael asked. Come and see, answered Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, he said about him, Here is a real Israelite. There is nothing false in him. Nathanael asked him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Teacher, answered Nathanael, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, do you believe just because I told you I saw you when you were under the fig tree? You will see much greater things than this. And he said to them, I am telling you the truth. You will see heaven open and God's angels going up and coming down on the son of man. When I began looking at this passage and working on it, I had no idea that the President of the United States was apparently going to accidentally more or less paraphrase Nathaniel and say in more graphic language than I'm prepared to repeat during worship, can anything good come out of Haiti, El Salvador, or Africa? So thank you, I suppose, Donald Trump, for providing me with a sermon illustration. I try not to be too partisan about politics while preaching, and I do hate to give Trump more airtime than he already has. But some examples are just too sharply appropriate not to use. Of course, the illustration, like all illustrations, is not perfect. I'm unwilling, for example, to recognize any further parallel between Trump and Nathaniel, a man described by Jesus as having nothing false in him. Still, although Nathaniel may have been an upright man, he wasn't without his prejudices, as evidenced by his opinion of the people of Galilee. To be fair, Nathaniel had his reasons for cynicism. Not only was Galilee a rural backwater at the time, it was also a hotbed of radicals, such as Judas of Galilee, who led an armed uprising against the same Roman census that had caused Mary and Joseph to have to go to Bethlehem. He also founded the Zealots, a milit militant Jewish sect whose revolt years later would lead to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Philip's response, though, to Nathaniel's prejudice is classic. Three simple words, come and see. There's something about these three words that for me summarizes the difference between the kind of calling that we perhaps see more often in the Old Testament and the kind of calling that we see in the New Testament. I say that with some caution because we should never behave as if the Old Testament and the New Testament are separate or that one is better than the other. But if we compare how Samuel hears the call of God and how Nathaniel hears the call of Christ, there are both similarities and differences. Both calls are personal. So God calls Samuel by name. This is the boy who is dedicated to his service. He knows him and he knows his ears will be open. Jesus also knows Nathaniel. He immediately says things about him, expressing awareness of his nature, that he is a, a true Israelite, an upright man, and showing that he saw Nathaniel under the fig tree before Philip spoke to him. So God knows Samuel and Jesus knows Nathaniel, but the way they communicate this knowing is different. God speaks to Samuel about himself. 
He gives one of those sort of I the Lord sort of statements that we see in the Psalms, telling Samuel about what has happened and about what is going to happen to Eli. And Samuel would recognize this kind of pattern, this way of God speaking. But Jesus speaks to Nathanael individually as a person about Nathanael. He tells him about himself, not just about God, about Jesus. He tells him about himself. The way God calls Samuel is a bit like a command, a message that has to be passed on. But the way Jesus calls Nathanael is an invitation, an offer to come and see who Jesus is for himself. Now, it seems to me that only God can issue the kind of calling that is in the nature of a command. And it's one of the hesitations that I have about certain kinds of preaching and evangelism that seem based on the idea of telling people that they must follow God. There may be times when a call to repentance and forgiveness and a, and a blast of prophecy is necessary. But more often, I think, we as Christians are called to say, come and see. It's one of the things we do by, by having the Acorn Center there. We're inviting people in through the week and saying, come and see what we do. It's a role that all followers of Christ, not just those with a special calling or a particular calling, because we are all special, can fill. It's Jesus who makes it easier for us to understand God, to see what holiness looks like when it is part of humanity. It makes it possible for God to invite us not just to hear him, but to meet him, to know him. Evangelism these days gets a bad press, sometimes because it's misused or misrepresented, but we should never underestimate the power of personal witness, of simply telling people what God matters, what God does in our life and why it matters, not always with words, but through our actions and our commitments. It's part of the reason why we've taken this step into opening up the live streaming. Yes, very much we want to use the live streaming to connect with folks in the community who have already been part of our uh, community here. So folk who were members but can't come anymore or still are members, people who can't make it, people who are ill, people who are abroad, all those kind of things. But we also want to be able to invite others to come and see what happens here. And we're not doing this out of any desire for publicity. We're not doing this because we want to say was like us, although I have to say the singing has been splendid, thank you very much. So it is nice that people can hear that. But we're doing it because there may be people out there, people beyond the limitations that we automatically have because of geography and time, people who could still Meet Christ here through us. There are many people in the Western world in particular today who have a prejudice against the church. It might be a, a gentle prejudice, like an assumption that we're boring, no better than a, a Brussels sprout for those of us who find them uninspired. Or it might be a more negative prejudice, a more hostile one, the idea that the church is actually malicious or backwards or destructive. There are many people in our society asking, can anything good come out of Christianity? Or can anything good come out of the church? Even between denominations, we can get people asking, can anything good come out of the Church of Scotland? If we're to have any hope of eliminating or dismantling those prejudices, we have to be able to say, come and see. Come and see what it looks like to try and be a people of God. Come and see not what we're doing, but what God is doing. Come and see what God might be calling you to do. Come and see that he might already know you and have prepared a place for you. Come and see that if he loves a motley group like us, then surely he loves you too. We need to use all the tools at our disposal to show that we're not cut off from others, we're not some privileged group or club, but we're a group that's engaged with our community and our town, that are thinking about the issues of the day and of the world, that we're willing to learn and willing to grow. Sometimes I think that the problem with people like Trump is that he's lived in a world of privilege for so long 
that he can no longer truly see the world as it is. He thinks he can command others to accept his version of the truth, a truth based around the idea that the world is composed of winners and losers, and that it's the winners that we need to listen to. If we're called to anything, then we are called to challenge that notion. There's a Christian de denomination I've heard of whose name makes me uncomfortable. They're called the Winner's Chapel. And it's true that Paul in particular uses examples of races and winning and such forth in the Bible. And we do speak about the victory of Christ. But time and again in the Gospels, we're called to recognize that the people that the world sees as winners are not the people that Jesus comes to champion. They are not the people he chooses to spend his time with. Jesus came out of a town of losers. He spent his ministry listening to other so-called losers and inviting them to come and follow me. He also challenged the ancient world's winners on their version of the truth. If we're going to be able to respond to God's call, however and wherever it comes with the words, here I am, we need to know he doesn't call us because we're winners, because we're special, because we're bigger or better or smarter or more technologically savvy than anybody else. We need to let go of the idea that it's about us at all. We may need to let go of old ideas of authority and the position of the church, which might not work anymore, just like Eli had to get rid of the idea of inherited authority that he could pass on to his sons. We need to let go of prejudices, old and new, that tell us who is worthy and who is not. Like Philip, we need to be so confident in who Christ is, in what he does, that we can say, come and see to others, all kinds of others. And when they come, to show them not a people who know all about God, but a people who long to know God, a people who are self-aware, and God aware, a people willing to embrace new things, new ideas, and new people. God knows us, and he calls us just as we are, no more, no less. It's often in the countries and the people that others ignore or consider beneath them that he can be most clearly found and most clearly heard. It's not a once and for all invitation. Jesus keeps on asking us to come and see. Come and find out more about him. Come and learn how to be kinder, less selfish, more loving. You don't have to be special to be called. Set aside as Samuel was. You just need to come and see. Come and see the world as Christ sees it. Come and see with an open mind and an open heart. The rest, as it should be, is up to God. The God who made us and who loves us and who calls each one of us by name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In response to God's calling, to his deep knowing of us, let's sing this, this lovely setting of Psalm 139. O oh God, you search me and you know me.
Let us pray. God of grace and love, you know each of us intimately. You can read the unspoken concerns of our hearts and still you appreciate our invitation to you in response to your own invitation. And so come and see, Lord God, the things that make our heart ache. Come and hear our anxieties and our concerns. Come and share our struggles and our challenges. Lord, on a day when we have spoken of calling, we pray for all who are feeling isolated or alone, unsure of their worth or their value to anyone, uncertain of how to solve some problem or circumstance. Help them to know that you are with them and send them the companionship and support they need. Be with all who actively give care to others, paid or unpaid. They too can be lonely, stressed, feel unappreciated. Give them strength and patience and moments of lightness and laughter to ease their burden. Comfort those who grieve or who have had to let go of a relationship or job or role and are unsure of the future. May they find fresh purpose and energy as they take their first steps into the next stage of their lives. Give courage and self-belief to those whom society or people of power consider unimportant. Help us to respond to your call, not just to treat everyone as we would be treated, but to welcome them with active love, a love which is not sentiment, but real practical action. Grant a special blessing to those nations who daily struggle with challenges we cannot even imagine and who respond to those challenges with imagination, faith, and hope. Help us to face the challenges of our own nation as we work for a fairer society. Grant strength to all who work to change unfair or oppressive structures, institutions, or practices. Keep our social, economic, and political leaders honest and accountable. Thank you for the many throughout the centuries who have had the courage to answer, here I am when you call, and the humility to come and see where you have been at work. We pray for all who have answered your call, your call to come and see, particularly in difficult times and places. Keep us learning and growing as we seek to serve you in faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our offerings will now be dedicated. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for these gifts for the work of the church and the time and talent that is, answered, that is offered along with them in answer to your call. Thank you for the generosity they represent and help us to continue to be willing to give generously, to enable us to respond to your call and to invite others to come and see. Amen. Church news today, um, there's an encounter deadline coming up and an Acorn Centre management team meeting. Um, the other notes are to do with the, the live streaming. We are still looking for more volunteers for Benahee View, so if you haven't given me your name already, then please do. Um, the idea is to have folk who can go in on, um, it might be one Sunday a month, it might be less often if we have more people to sit with the folk at Benahee View as they watch the service and interact with them. I have um, one sad announcement to make, and that is the passing of Thelma Gregg. And Thelma's funeral will be here on Wednesday at one o'clock. So our thoughts and prayers are with Jane and Anne and Ian and the rest of the family. I don't think we have any other notices that I, yep, Bob, yep. 
Is this Bible discussion week? That is a, that is a very good point. Where are we? Uh, hang on, let's calculate. Is this the last Sunday of the month coming up? No, this is not the last Wednesday, so no. We've got one more, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Bob keeps me right. All of you keep me right, which is a good thing. Absolutely. Thank you, Bob. So I will remember to put that in next week's intimations. Let's finish by singing together a song of commitment, singing in Christ alone, which is a song that reminds us that who we are called to is, is Christ, who we are called to follow. And let us, let us sing of that. So let us go knowing that however weak or strong we feel today, however sure or unsure we are of the call of God, it is his power that calls us on, that calls us home. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all. <laughs>